Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Over the last four years that I have had this channel, I have cataloged close to a thousand videos now, deep diving scandalous stories. As most of you know, who have been on this channel for a while with me on this journey, I have covered some pretty deplorable people in our history. This person up to now, up to four years that I've been on YouTube, is probably one of the most psychotic and psychopathic human beings that I have ever talked about. Again, I've covered many, many crazy cases that have been hard to film at times, but this particular person to let you guys in on a little secret, I have been putting off filming this episode because I have a such a hard time with this person's story and just the level of depravity that existed within this human being. And what makes it just even more disgusting is that history has labeled this person as a great. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big, big thank you to all of our producers and our Patreons here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to join our Patreon or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to finish up talking about the notorious Peter the Great. Now, if you are new to this channel, if you are a history buff and you just stumbled upon this video, a little bit of background in this little series that we are working on when we're dealing with the Romanovs. This is not necessarily a mystery video, although Mondays typically I do uh, Monday mystery, but it is leading up to a big mystery, which is the Anastasia Romanov conspiracy. And when we ended 2023, we spoke a lot about Rasputin. And so my idea was to come into 2024 actually looking at the Romanov family. And as I started to look at the Anastasia conspiracy, I realized that there is so much more to the Romanovs and we do need to, to go, kind of go back and look at the family tree. And so if you've missed the first couple of episodes that we've done over some of these big more notorious Romanovs. I will link them down in the description box for you to look at. Part one of Peter the Great really was a look at his sister, Sophia, which I'm going to give a little bit of background before we start this video. So you don't necessarily have to go back and watch part one of this. If you don't want to, you can start with part two, although I will be putting part one about his sister, Sophia, down in the description box below. 
I'm also premiering this pretty early in the morning because at nine o'clock Eastern time, I will be over with my friends in South Africa on Aquarius Rising Africa to have a live conversation about this, this person, about Peter the Great. And so I do like to air these pretty early on Monday morning so that many of you guys watching can, can listen to the research I have, perhaps do a little bit of digging yourself, and then join us over um, on Aquarius Rising Africa so you too can participate in the conversation around Peter the Great and the Romanovs. Now, again, if you have just stumbled upon my channel, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm, I'm so appreciative. I'm a lover of history. I really find history to be very, very fascinating, especially with the pettiness and the scandals of our ancestors' past. However, I look at history from a very different perspective. Right now, most of us know that we're in a time when um, there's a lot of secrets that are being revealed, where the veil is thinning, and we're coming into the age of Aquarius, whatever you want to call it, what, what the Great Awakening, whatever that means to you. So for me, as somebody who is a history lover, I have decided to go back and look at, re-look at some of these historical figures from a different perspective. Um, if you know anything about the book of Revelation and the Bible, it does say that at this time that we're in, that we will start to realize that things are inverted, that what we thought was good is actually bad and vice versa. And this is really important because, again, as I said in the opening, I have started to learn, as many of you guys have probably also started to learn, that many of these historical figures that we've been told were the greats, like Alexander the Great. I mean, I've covered Alexander the Great. What a psychopath. He was a cannibal. Like, what a psychopath. You know, um, they weren't so great. They weren't. They were pretty horrific. And Peter the Great is no different. He was a draconian tyrant. Now, I want to mention with Peter the Great that I am aware and I do have empathy as a human being for the little boy, for little Peter, because little Peter's life, as we talked about last week, was definitely not ideal, even though he was born in the court of the Romanovs. He definitely was born into a war zone between his father's first wife's children and his first wife's family and his mother, who was Peter's, or who was his father's, excuse me, Alexei's second wife. And there was a lot of, 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 of uh, plots to unalive them um, that Peter had to deal with when he was very, very young. So I am aware that there is a lot of PTSD that Peter was obviously dealing with. I don't think they knew what PTSD was back then. But in 2024, I, I do acknowledge that probably part of Peter's personality had a lot to do with trauma that he, he was carrying. And I, I, I especially... Leading up to his death, you can definitely look at uh, what was going on with his health before he passed away as, as probably being more trauma-induced, but, but we'll get to that. The other reason why I want to talk and look and look a little bit deeper at the Romanovs, and my friend Rocker Mike was on with Shanti the other day, and he, he brought up a really good point. Especially for Americans, we want to paint things black and white. We want a good guy and we want a bad guy. In a lot of situations, there are no good guys and bad guys. It's all shades of gray. And so when we look at the Romanovs, and especially when we move forward and we look at the bulk of its revolution, as we're leading up to with the Anastasia conspiracy, a lot of people want to believe that the Romanovs were the good guys and that the Bolkovich were the bad guys. And that for some reason, they believe that this Anastasia conspiracy, her still being alive, is going to be what comes in and saves us. And that's not true. That's not true. I mean, I don't know if Anastasia was a good person. She was a child when she passed away. She probably was very innocent. But the Romanovs were not good as a whole. Now, as I've said many times, I believe every single human being needs to stand on their own two feet. We can't judge somebody just because of their last name. Like every person is responsible for his or her own behavior. But generally speaking, most of the Romanovs were as tyrannical, if not more tyrannical, than all the other monarchs across the globe. Yes, the Bolkovich were bad. Obviously, look what happened to Russia after the revolution. But it doesn't mean that the Romanovs were good. And regardless of whether Anastasia survived or not, really makes no difference to you. 
because you are responsible for saving you. All right, you guys. So with that being said, that is why we're looking at the Romanoffs again, if you're new to the channel. So let's go ahead and get into it. Like I said, in part one, we talked about Peter's birth and we talked about all of the struggles that were going on between the two family lines from his father, Alexi's first wife who passed away. And then his second wife, who was Peter's mother. So Peter was the firstborn son of Alexi's second wife. And I, he really was never expected to rule. But as if you remember from last week or the last time, not last, if you remember from the last time we spoke about this case, from Alexi's first wife, many of the boys passed away young. And so there was two boys left at Alexi's death. This was Fyodor III and Ivan. Now, I said last week I actually liked Fyodor. He did not live that long, though. Even when he was in his coronation, he had to be held by the aristocrats, the boyars, because his health was so bad. So he did not live that long. And with Ivan, the youngest son of um, Alexei, with his first wife, who was older than um, Peter, Ivan was not mentally he did not have the mental capacity to be the czar. And so basically what they did was they created Peter and Ivan to be co-czars. Now, both of these were children, small, small children. And so in order to have them be co-czars after the passing of their older brother, Fyodor III, there had to be a regent. A regent is basically somebody who kind of rules in place of the kids and also is responsible for preparing the kids to eventually, or the child, in most cases one child, but in this case there were two, to eventually take over when they come of age. And this was their sister, Sophia. Now, Sophia was Ivan's full sister, and she was Peter's half-sister. Now, I said this in the previous episode, that to me, whether you're a half-sibling or a full sibling, it makes no difference. You're still a sibling. But for this, Sophia definitely had aggression towards um, Peter and Peter, Peter's mother, Natalia, who was still alive at the time. And Sophia herself was very, very power hungry. And she definitely ruled with an iron fist. She separated the boys. She sent um, Peter and his mother out into the country to live, which actually ended up being very beneficial for, for Peter. But in 1862, there was what is now referred to as the Moscow Uprising. And basically what Sophia did is that she started this campaign. She plotted this propaganda, this fake news that Peter and more importantly, Peter's mother, because Peter was still a young child, were planning to have her and Ivan eliminated. This was not true. And so this caused a huge uprising and peter as a very young boy around 10 years old witnessed a lot of his confidants the adults in his life his uncles all that kind of stuff basically unalived in front of him and knowing as he was growing up that he was not safe from his sister sophia his half sister and that she was constantly gunning for him and gunning for Natalia, his mother, and really, really, truly wanted to rule with her full-blooded brother, Ivan, who was also Peter's half-brother. And again, Ivan was not intellectually competent enough to, to, be, to rule. And so this is where we start to see the PTSD in uh, Peter. It is said that after the Moscow uprising, after the young boy witnessed this horrific thing happen to him. And I, I want to acknowledge that I absolutely, even though I have disdain for Peter, I can absolutely acknowledge that he had a very rough childhood and he was exposed to things that no child should ever be exposed to. And at this point, we understand the human brain more and the development of the human brain. And so I do acknowledge that he went through a horrific ordeal at a very young age. I, I acknowledge that. So for all of his childhood, he was kind of walking on pins and needles regarding his sister, for, who at this point, for all intent and purposes, is the czar. Even though Peter and Ivan are technically the czars, and Sophia, their sister, is the regent, she's acting fully as the czar. Well, if you remember from last week, as time went on, when Peter became of age, Ivan was already of age, then Peter, who was a little bit younger than him, became of age. It was time for Sophia to 
pass the baton basically over to Peter and Ivan, which she refused to do. Again, all that information is in last the last video we did, which will be in the description box below if you want a more thorough understanding of what happened. But she basically refused. And she tried to do the same thing that she had done with the Moscow uprising, where she started these rumors that that people were plotting her death and Ivan's death from Natalia's family, from Peter's maternal line's family. It didn't work this time, though. So this was this is where our our story actually picks up today because this happened on June 9th of 1689, and Peter basically like cowboys up at this point. He sends a letter to Ivan. He's like, "Our sister's out of hand. We're the czars. We have to to really." take action and get her off of the throne. Well, in 1989, some other, I mean, I'm going to try to go in order of years here so that we can kind of keep the story straight of everything that's going on in Peter's life throughout the duration of his life. And in, in, in uh, excuse me, 1689, 1989, 1689, um, he marries his first wife. And this is a woman named, and I, I, again, another thing, disclaimer, guys, I'm not Russian, so I apologize if I butcher any of these names. It's not intentional. But he marries his first wife, Eudoxia. Eudoxia was picked by Natalia, the mother, because it was a good match for, for Peter. Obviously, a lot of these marriages within these royal families are very political. They're not, they're not love matches. And there definitely was no love, especially from Peter when it came to Eudoxia. At this point, Peter, because he was kind of seen as the family outcast, if you can say that, even though he was technically the czar, growing up with Sophia's under Sophia's regency, he spent a lot of time in what was called the foreign quarters. This was an area in Moscow where you know, people of, of Germanic uh, heritage or dutch heritage kind of lived and so he started to learn he started to go and hang out with these these other europeans these more western europeans he started to learn their customs he started to learn their languages he started to have love affairs with with women who were more western european and and his mother as well natalia if you remember from the first part, she also comes from Western heritage. And so this is one thing that Peter the Great is famous for. Before I actually really looked into Peter the Great, that was one thing I remembered from school was that he went and lived in Europe for a while and studied uh, how to make boats and brought all that information back to Russia. And that's how he developed Russia as, as, a, as a huge empire was because he studied a lot of the Western European models. He's known for taking Russia out of this old Orthodox way of life into the more modern European way of life. And, and this is very much fantasized. This is a, you know, the victors write history, right? The people who win are the ones who write the history books. So everything that Peter did is romanticized and is seen as this incredible thing. He built St. Petersburg, all that kind of stuff. But in the reality, and we're going to talk about this, it, it wasn't that great for the Russian people. He became very tyrannical, but I digress. In 1689, leading up to 1689, to when now Sophia is, is stalemating and not getting off her throne when she should, that, that was the agreement, Peter has this whole time been kind of intermingling with other Europeans. He's having some tryst, some love affairs with European women. He's also forced to marry Eudoxia, who's more of a Orthodox Russian woman um, through his mother. And then we have Sophia sent away to the monastery. So by September of 1689, Sophia has basically been forced to relinquish her power over to her brothers, Peter and Ivan. She is now living in a monastery. A lot of her supporters have been executed because of their support of Sophia. So Peter's coming in really strong. Again, Ivan is beside him, but again, Ivan's not mentally competent. So it's really Peter who's pulling all the strings at this point. Again, Peter is married to Eudoxia in 1689 as well. And by 1690, Eudoxia does give birth to Peter's oldest son, his first son, who was a little boy named the Grand Duke Alexei Petrovich of Russia. He was born on the 18th of February, 1690. Now, 
Eudoxia will go on to have a couple more sons with Peter, but they these these other two sons will not live past um, their infancy. So uh, Alexia, the the first son with Eudoxia, is now the prince. He is the the heir apparent to the Romanov throne, and this is really important. If you remember last week, we or the last time, if you remember the last time we spoke about this with Sophia. Whoever was going to inherit the throne after Ivan and Peter depended on which one, Ivan or Peter, had a son first. Um, and it was Peter. So Alexei is now based. Peter's one. His, his family line has now won for continuing this particular bloodline on the throne. Well, Eudoxia and Alexia are not going to have good relationships with their father. In fact, both of them are treated pretty terribly by their father, by Alexia's father and Eudoxia's husband, which we're going to get into a little bit later. I just want to kind of set the state, the scene of how important Alexia's birth was, because at this point, Ivan is still alive. And now Peter has definitely secured his place, his family's line through Natalia, the mother's line on the Romanov throne. So there's a lot of pressure on Alexia. Like on that birth, that kid had a lot of pressure coming from the court, right? We also see a huge discrepancy between Eudoxia and Peter because Eudoxia is very Orthodox Russian. She is not somebody who's interested in Western European culture. She's very um, conservative in her views. She's very faithful to her her heritage, where Peter is from a very young age, very fascinated by the West. So we already have conflicting opinions. I, I imagine it would be a lot like a hardcore Republican being forced to marry a hardcore Democrat. There would be a lot of clashes there. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the military history with Peter. I've said this before. If you are new to this channel, um, I'm not, I love history, but I'm not really, military history is not my wheelhouse. Um, I only speak about certain military information if it's prevalent to the point of the story and the point of this story is more about the draconian and tyrannical um practices of peter the great so i am only going to speak very briefly about some military stuff that was going on with peter if you are somebody who is interested in military history there are amazing channels out there that people who can really explain it to you that's just not my wheelhouse when it comes to history so i apologize if you're expecting more of peter's military history because there is a lot um but we're not we're only going to mention a, a few things and one of those is going to be what's called the holy league Peter put Russia into what was this holy league, this alliance between other Western European kingdoms. And this was basically pushed back from the Ottomans. The Ottomans had been <laughs> problematic for a quite a quite a while. And at this point, we do see in like 1695, we do see Peter have some victory against the Ottomans through a river using water using boats which is the first incl inclination we're going to get of peter's um fascination and obsession with creating russia to be a strong naval naval power now in 1696 the next year ivan does pass away so at this point peter is the only reigning czar because ivan was 29 years old uh, he not only was he mentally incompetent but he was sickly anyway um and he does pass away so peter is now the main guy on the throne at six in 1695. in 1697 peter makes a very bold move and this is what i was referring to again this is the one thing i remembered about peter from school before i did a, another deep dive into him he decides that he is going to go on a tour of these european uh principalities these kingdoms at the time and, and he doesn't go on this tour as peter the great as czar peter as a king he actually goes under a different name and he works as he works in sh shipyards in holland he goes up to england because england obviously has a very strong naval and he studies and nobody knows that he's actually the czar and he's left his empire behind in the hands of his council now again this is 1697 to 1698 when he does this when he goes incognito around which i will give him like props for that that's pretty clever to do that especially if you're 
the czar and you're like, I'm going to go incognito and I'm going to learn how to build ships from the ground up. I'm going to work with the peasants and figure this out so I can bring that information back to my own country and, and declare us as, a, as an empire, not just on land, but by sea too. So that was pretty clever, but, but he leaves some of his confidants in charge of his kingdom while he's away. And on the meantime, Sophia herself is still sitting in this monastery. And if you remember from the last time we talked about this, even though she had resigned herself to her fate, which was the monastery, she was still in communication with these boyars, these aristocrats that supported her and wanted her, and more specifically, her maternal line's bloodline on the throne. Now, Ivan is gone now, so and Ivan only had daughters, so they want to bring Sophia back, get Peter gone, and bring Sophia back. In 1698, while Peter is in Holland, working on ships 4000 people 4000 people make their way into moscow to invade the kremlin so 4000 army men military men in support of sofia being on the throne make their way into moscow but they were stopped in New Jerusalem, which is about 30 miles outside of Moscow by Peter's army. So even though Peter's not there, the people he left in charge were aware of this invasion, that it was coming. And they did stop. They they, they conquered this army for Sophia and in and, 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 and Sophia's, you know, battling for Sophia to come back, come back to power. They stopped them. And there was very harsh punishments at this time for these 4,000 men. At this point, 130 of them were executed. 140 were flogged or whipped and sent into, into exile. And 1,960 were banished. Now, I don't know what the difference between exiling and banishing someone is, but there is in the history books, It is there is a difference between the two. So... I would love to be enlightened by any one of you history nerds that knows the difference between banishing someone and exiling something, someone because it kind of sounds like the same thing. Unless exiling someone means they're sent to a specific location where they have to live, like Siberia, and maybe banishing someone just says, you can go anywhere, but you can't be here. Maybe. I don't know. But nonetheless, in August, Peter returns, and he returns pissed. He's so mad. He's so mad about this. And so he decides to investigate the matter further. He had 2,000 more men executed and 600 more men flogged. Now, with the bodies of those dearly departed who had been executed, he does something even more wicked. He hangs some of the bodies outside the Kremlin in, in Moscow, where he lives, but he also takes some of the bodies and hangs them outside of the window of Sophia's room so that she has to look at these dead bodies. She can't go anywhere. She is now put under severe lock and key, and she is forced to, quote unquote, take the veil. Now, taking the veil in Catholicism, I had to look this up because I'm not Catholic, um, means to become a, become a nun. She had to become a nun. So she, she wasn't just going to be living in a monastery, but now she's going to be forced to become a nun. And she takes the name Susanna and she is literally imprisoned for the rest of her life. She is watched like a hawk. She spends the last 15 years of her life pretty much in a jail cell, and she ends up dying in 1704 at only 46 years old, five years older than myself. Now, very, very young. Now, it is important to mention that in 1703, the year before Sophia's death, um, St. Petersburg is founded by Peter the Great, obviously named after him. <laughs> I love when narcissists throughout history do that. <laughs> like when we cut when we cover Constantine and the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople, it's like our Alexander the Great and Alexandria. Like, you know you're a narcissistic psychopath when you name a city after yourself. Just following the playbook. Peter the Great is just following the playbook over what it means to be a narcissistic psychopath. Name a city after you. So I wanted to just mention that. He then moves the capital from Moscow to St. Petersburg. 
why wouldn't he? Which is obviously a lot closer to Western Europe, and there are going to be some scuffles with the Dutch and, and Sweden and all that kind of stuff, which, again, if you're more interested in military history, there are some fabulous channels out there. We're not going to really get into that for the sake of this video today. But going back to 1698, when Sophia, you know, had her last little, like, hurrah trying to take over Russia again, things go from bad to worse with Peter's marriage to Eudoxia. So not only is he dealing with his sister and executing all these people and hanging their bodies, but he's so fed up with Eudoxia that he sends her off to a monastery and sends his son Alexia to be raised by his sister, another woman named Natalia, after their mother. So mother and son are separated. He then files from, for a formal divorce from Eudoxia. At this point, he does have a mistress named Anna Mons, which we're going to get kind of into Anna Mons a little bit later on in the story. But he does have this mistress that he, for all intents and purposes, is treating like his wife. And Eudoxia is living in this monastery. Now, over time, just something so sadistic about Peter is that over time, Eudoxia, while, while she's in this monastery, the person who is the, you know, the proprietor of the, of the, um, a monastery, I don't know what they're called, it's not Catholic, basically allows Eudoxia to live like a lay person. So she's not really required to take on a religious life or like a monk-based life. She's she's allowed to live just like a normal person, like a lay person. And she is divorced from Peter at this this point. Now again, remember, throughout their whole marriage, Peter had, I mean, Peter was a sex addict. He had so many mistresses in one report, I read that he actually charged women to sleep with him because that's that's you know what he thought of himself. So she had to put up with her husband who treated her like crap, who never loved her, who treated their son like crap, even though he needed their son when their son was first born because Uncle Ivan was still alive. And so having Alexi secured Peter's bloodline. So he needed the son, but he treated him like crap. And then he separates mother and son, gives the son to his sister, his aunt, to raise him. His mother is banished to a monastery and is now divorced from Peter. And she's put up with all this crap. And so she ends up taking a lover, which right 2024, who cares? She's divorced. And I'm sure the proprietor of the monastery kind of felt bad for her anyway. I mean, I feel bad for her. Like, what a crappy life to live. Well, this love affair with Eudoxia and her new man, her new boyfriend, goes on for about nine years before P P Peter finds out about it. Now, I'm going to, again, reiterate, they're divorced. Eudoxia and Peter are divorced. Peter has Anna Mons now, a mistress living with him, acting as a wife, amongst other mistresses. Eudoxia is living a quiet life. She's not making waves. She's just living her quiet life in her monastery. She probably misses her son. So when, Pe but when Peter finds out that she has this boyfriend... He decides that he's going to execute the boyfriend. And not only is he going to execute the boyfriend, but he's going to do it by impaling him. And not only that, but Eudoxia is going to be forced to watch. And this, my friends, again, I recognize that Peter dealt with a lot of childhood trauma. But childhood trauma will cause you to have behavioral habits like maybe you're quick to, to have a boundary up or you're quick to try to attack someone before they attack you. But it's not going to lead you to being sadistic. It's not going to lead you to go out of your way to hurt other people like this, especially someone who's never done anything to you. The woman who gave you your son that secured your family bloodline on the throne. She's not done anything to you. She went silently to the monastery. She had her son taken away from her. You treated her like crap. And for nine years, she finally had a little bit of happiness and you had to come in and do something so horrific to her. To impale someone is one of the most horrific forms of execution it's not a quick death and then to force her to watch this is sadistic 
during this time as well, we see this horrific behavior coming from Peter within his own, own peer group. He brings all these cultures into Russia that are Western cultures that I love, but my ancestors are Western Europeans. Like I'm French, German, English, Greek. I got a little Lebanese in me too. That's not Western Germany, but I got a little that in me as well. I got a little Egyptian in me too. A little Coptic Egyptian, but you know, the, the, these, 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 um, cultural holiday celebrations that we we know and love in the western world but wasn't culturally done in russia like he changes the calendar to the western calendar he changes the way people dress now they have to dress in more of a western clothing they have to get rid of all the orthodox russian um clothing and and, and they he he basically does this like beard tax where because it's more in vogue in western europe for men to shave he makes a beard tax and so the only people who are allowed in russia to have beards are clergymen and peasants if a aristocratic person or a middle class joe schmo regular guy wants to have a beard they have to pay a beard tax and this beard tax was about 600 rubles a year which works out to about a hundred thousand dollars now just to have a beard so look at this tyrannical stuff like look at this you can't even dress the way you want to dress you can't even grow a beard if you want to grow a beard that's so foreign to us today because we can do whatever the fuck we want with our bodies and our and our hair and our faces now this is unbelievable he's starting to bankrupt the country he's 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 bo he's boiling down coins to pull some of the silver out which is causing massive inflation in fact it was so horrific what he was doing to his own people at this time that a conspiracy started to spread around russia that this was not actually the original peter people started a conspiracy that the real peter was obviously imprisoned somewhere in europe from his travels when he was in 1697 and 1698 when he was bopping around learning how to build ships that that peter obviously got imprisoned and this is an imposter that's come in Reminds me a lot of the conspiracies we have going around right now, actually. And most of those conspiracies, I think, are junk conspiracies, as you guys know. Well, I think this is a junk conspiracy, too. I think that was the real, the real Peter. I just think the real Peter was a psychopath. It was not about him building an empire for the sake of his people. It was about him building an empire for the sake of himself. Another thing Peter did was to the peasants. He forced like one out of 20 peasantry boys to join the military uh, for as lifetime members, they had no choice. Now I have certain opinions about the draft. I'm not actually a fan of the draft, even though I am a huge patriot in my own country. I'm very proud to be an American. I love my country. I do, and I do appreciate the military and I appreciate everything the, mil the military has done for us. I, believe that every human life that every human being should choose what they want to do in 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 their life and that no government should ever tell its people what they can and cannot do so when i saw this you know he ended up building a huge military because of this and this is how russia ended up going from a small state to an empire because of peter it was done through duress coercion and threats of violence this is not a good thing this is traumatic what he's doing to these innocent boys these innocent humans you know i'm sure peter did not see them as humans i'm, I'm sure he saw them as as his you know as a narcissist or a psychopath he doesn't see other human beings as being actual human beings but sees them as toys that he can do with what he wants and for him, he want, he had the audacity to want the world to know he was the best. And so he used the innocent blood of his people to make that happen for his own ego and for his own self. And I am just horrified. I cannot listen. I love the Russian people. I recognize, I think as most of us do in this time of great awakening, that we are not our governments. It's never been about the people of a country that are the problem. It's the rulers of a country that are the problems. And they're all playing chess with themselves. 
thinking that it's us against us when it's never been us against us. It's always been them. They are the problem. And so I feel a horrible heartache for the people who are descendants of this because I cannot imagine the trauma that was passed down from this person in your country. In fact, Peter's behavior was so bad that for a long time, people believed that Peter was the Antichrist spoken about in the Bible. I think somebody should make a list somewhere that states every single historical person that's been accused of being the Antichrist, just so we can see see how many people we've assumed were the Antichrist. But I'll tell you something about Peter. So the Cassiopeia the Cassiopeians say that Russia has a lot of karma right now because Russia was a huge part of the fall of Atlantis. And if you guys have been on this channel for a while, you know that I'm very dubious of some timelines. Um, I'm able to recognize that there is the official timeline narrative that we're talking about right now. And then there's this other timeline narrative. We don't know which is true and which is not true. So I'm able to hold two ideas in my head at the same time. But I believe that the fall of Atlantis was the apocalypse. Meaning that what we're going through right now is actually Gog and Magog, which is the Ascension. So if, if, if the Cassiopeians are correct and Russia karmically had a lot to do with the fall of Atlantis, and maybe Atlantis wasn't as far off as we thought it was because of the Tartarian stuff, was Peter the Great the Antichrist? Maybe. Maybe. Anyway. Now, 12 years into Peter's relationship with Anna Mons, she does end up cheating on him. <laughs> but he's nicer to, to Anna in this, this cheating escapade than he ever was to Eudoxia or any other woman. So he, like, dismisses her and, like, imprisons her with her sisters and her house. Very easy punishment compared to most people that, that make Peter mad. Now, again, on top of this, Peter also has his own affairs, right? So he's not innocent. So he's definitely, you know, oh, by the grace of God, go I, Peter. Like you're punishing people for things that you're actually doing. At this point, he meets a new woman named Marta. And this becomes his new mistress. And he ends up falling in love with Marta and he marries her. Marta then changes her name to Catherine. She becomes Catherine the first of Russia. Something interesting about Catherine too, she is someone historically was who was known to dye her hair black so that she did not look like the fair haired Anna Mons, which I'm I'm our Anna Mons. I'm sure she looked Anna Mons probably looked more like me, as most Northern European women do have blonde hair, blue eyes. And so she would dye her hair dark so she could separate herself from Anna Mons. Now, 1707 is when he married her. She will end up becoming Empress Catherine I, which we're going to get into, but we're not there yet. During this time, there's this growing divide that's happening in Russia. There are people that are still kind of supporting Eudoxia, who is kind of ordained by the Orthodox Church, Church as the Sovereign One. And through Eudoxia, they're supporting her son, Alexia, who's also Peter's son and Peter's heir to the throne. Now, Catherine will go on and have about like 11, 12, 13 children with Peter. So Peter's going to have more kids with Catherine, but Alexi is still the firstborn. He's still the first son. He's the kid, the baby at his birth that ensured Peter's line of the Romanoffs would maintain the throne even before Ivan passed away. So Alexei was pulled from his mother, raised by his aunt. Alexei cannot stand his father. Alexei thinks his father is a douchebag. He thinks he is just horrific. Like Alexei is horrified by his father's behavior. At some point, Alexei even tries to run to Austria to defect to a different country because he wants nothing to do with his father. This child is mortified by the way his father behaves and by the way his father treats his fellow countrymen, not to mention what his father did to his mother when he forced his mother to watch her boyfriend his stepdad, for all intent and purposes, be impaled. Not to mention just the the how Peter has been bankrupt his own country for his own ex. Alexia has made it very clear to his father that he wants nothing to do with Peter's policies, and that when he takes the throne, he will not 
he will not be be pushing Peter's policies forward. There is a huge rift between these two individuals. So much so that Alexei was arrested, sent to St. Petersburg, and put on trial for basically, he was accused of basically trying to take his father out and, and like kill his dad. And that, of course, is considered treason, treason if, if that's the king. And in 1718, Alexia was sentenced to death. Now, Alexia was tortured horrifically. And he was forced to give name of names of co-conspirators. And many historians believe that these that there was no conspiracy, even though Alexia was very vocal with his father, that he did not agree with his father and did not like what his father was doing and did not plan on on pursuing these policies when he became czar. That the, but there was actually no plot to kill Peter. This was all made up by Peter to try to kill his own son, which he succeeded in. Now, the funny thing is, or not the funny thing, now Alexia did not actually make it to his execution because he died in his jail cell before that happened. And it's probably because he was tortured so badly that his body just gave out. Now, he did have a, a few children, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about um, in a minute. But at first, I wanted to actually go to a website that I found and I really liked this website and I thought I'm going to share this with you guys because whoever wrote this website I agree with him completely and I'm glad to see that I am not the only person that thinks that there is a huge misunderstanding when we teach Peter the Great to our children. So this was written by Rick Archer in February of 2012. He says most people say that Peter the Great was a magnificent visionary. A typical intro into a career of Peter reads like this. One of Russia's greatest statesmen, Peter the Great, the Tsar and first emperor of Russia, was a man of unwavering willpower, extraordinary energy, and supreme vision. Having inherited a vast but backward state, he propelled Russia to the rank of a major European power, while his extraordinary personality and wide-scale wide reforms have been an inspiration to generations of historians, writers, and ordinary Russians. But I take a different view. Same. I take a totally different view. Rick and I agree on a lot. Although I agree that Peter accomplished great things, he was such a despicable human being that I shudder when I read the phrase Peter the Great. Same. He was despicable is a nice way to put him. Of all the men in history I've studied, few have disgusted me more than Peter of Russia. Same, as I was saying in the beginning of this video. This man was a thug and a despot. Peter was a vicious brute who was used to getting his way. He had so much power that he soon learned he could do anything he damn well pleased. He ran, he ran a ramshod over the Russian people with complete impunity. A physical powerful giant interesting right at six eight peter had intellectual gifts to match unfortunately he also possessed an extremely aggressive nature peter's behavior would make most mafia dawn seem like pollyanna in comparison peter wasn't interested in mannerly persuasions he would threaten intimidate and bully till he got what he wanted no one could resist him when someone didn't cooperate peter would use force to make them an offer they couldn't refuse. His penchant for cruelty bordered on barbaric. Anyone close to Peter was terrified of him. Many of the old guard Russian nobility hated Peter with a passion because of, because of his constant reforms at their expense. The boyers would do anything to get rid of this guy. Because Peter was hated by so many, plots were always being developed against him. Unfortunately for them, Peter had an amazing streak of luck. Some would always warn Peter, someone, excuse me, would always warn Peter at the last minute, allow him to escape assassination by narrow margins. Once to safety, Peter would then cast a wide net and gather up anyone even remotely associated with the plot and throw them into the dungeon. Although many of these people caught in the dragnet were innocent, the torture was so brutal and sadistic, they would eventually confess to anything just to get it over with. At this point, they were beheaded. Peter himself often took part in the beheadings himself. Their heads were impaled on spikes and left up there for the public display for months. Eudoxia, so the first wife. I mean, look at that picture, you guys. 
It is said that the curious picture of, the, of Peter the Great beating his wife hangs on the wall of the Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. In this case, then it could be interesting to know the reason. Eudoxia and Peter were both 17 when Peter's mother forced him to marry. His mother hoped to wean him from the wicked ways of the Moscow brothels by wedding him to a lady who was pious and as, as she was beautiful. Although she would bear him a son, the marriage was a total failure. Eudoxia had grown up with her nose in religious books. Since her mental horizons did not extend much further than her religious training, the brilliant Peter was bored beyond reason by her presence. Peter had the poor woman exiled to a lonely existence in a monastery as swiftly as he could possible. Alexia. So this is the son. The story of Alexia, Peter's son, from his marriage to Eudoxia reads like a Greek tragedy. Alexia, Peter's heir, was in direct line to become the next czar. Alexia's story brings up an interesting question. You are a parent. You have spent your entire life creating a business or an institution that you are rightfully proud of. Then you discover your only child intends to tear down your life work. Everything you had ever achieved is in jeopardy because he or she doesn't like you. And they have the power to do it. What do you do? Do you kill the kid? Nothing better demonstrates Peter, Peter's inherent cruelty than his treatment of his first son, Alexia. By all accounts, Alexia was a capable man. Unfortunately, due to his father's abuse of Alexia's mother's mother, Eudoxia, and his father's dictatorial relationship with the boy, the young man grew up hating his powerful father. Due to their poor relationship, like so many sons, Alexia rebelled against his father. He hated the man's constant criticism and bullying. Alexia hated the wife Peter had chosen for him. Alexia resisted the military career his father forced upon him. Alexia cursed the ground his father walked on. In private conversation, sometimes he was so mad at his father, he said he wished the man were dead. That said, Alexia never took a single action to hurt his father. Alexia just wanted to be left alone to live in peace. His father would have none of it. Alexia was his successor, and Peter was determined to make his son toe the line. Unfortunately for Alexia, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even though he did nothing wrong, Alexia would simply die because he was flesh and blood to a despot. The hatred of the Moscow nobility towards Peter constantly led them to conceive of ways to kill the dictator. If Peter were indeed killed, Alexia was next in line to take his place. Tsar Peter was quite aware just how much he was disliked. He also knew how easy it was to kill a man who wasn't looking. When he was younger, Peter had barely escaped two attempts on his life. This picture shows Peter at 16 narrowly escaping an assassination sent by his half-sister Sophia. After the near miss, Peter made it a point to look over his shoulder wherever he went for the rest of his life. You might even say he was paranoid. There is no question that Peter had a right to be worried. Thanks to years of excessive brutality, there were definitely plots on his life. Unfortunately, Peter had gained so many enemies that he had no idea who might send the next assassin. For his protection... Peter recruited a vast network of spies. Occasionally, his son's name was brought to his attention. Despite the fact that Alexia's name came up from time to time in secret conversations, no historical evidence has ever surfaced that Alexia was directly involved in any plots. The young man was probably innocent of any involvement in conspiracies. It was simply Alexia's misfortune that every plot and every cabal whispered Alexia's name as Peter's replacement. Alexia's name became the catchword for regime change. Thus, his ultra-paranoid father began to hear vague reports that Alexia's name had surfaced in conversations with men who were under suspicion for plots against the throne. Peter took note of the young man's insolence and rebellion and concluded Alexia's disobedience somehow confirmed the rumors must be true. Peter confronted the young man directly. This famous picture shows a meeting where Peter accused Alexia of conspiring against him. Alexia denied it, but Peter didn't believe him. Alexia wasn't stupid. Based on threats made by his father, Alexia could see his father didn't trust a word he said about his innocence. Alexia began to greatly fear for his life. With the help of a well-placed Muscovite nobleman, Alexia fled the country, taking his mystery, mistress, a Francina, with him for companionship. Alexia eventually made it to Austria, where he placed, where he pleaded with his brother-in-law, Emperor Charles VI, for sanctuary. Emperor 
Sincerely sympathized with Alexia, he too suspected Peter harbored murderous designs against his son. In a confidential let letter to George I of Great Britain, Charles VI told the king that he agreed Alexia's life was in danger. Meanwhile, Peter felt insulted. The flight of the Tsarevich to a foreign potentate was a reproach and a scandal. No one had the right to embarrass him like that. Peter determined Alexia had to be recovered and brought back to Russia at all cost. Peter sent an envoy to Austria promising total amnesty for Alexia. Mind you, Alexia's only crime was running away from his abusive father. Alexia would only consent to return on his father is solemnly swearing that if he came back, he should not be punished in the least. Alexia asked to be allowed to live quietly on the estates and, mar and marry Afranzia. Alexia said in return, he would swear away his birthright and allow Peter to pick a successor of his choosing. Peter agreed to these terms. Thus, Alexia returned to Russia. He was immediately imprisoned. Peter still suspected a grand plot in which his son was surely involved. He ordered his interrogators to spare nothing until they got to the bottom of the threats against him. Not only did they torture, Al torture Alexia, but they tortured his mistress as well. Under pressure, Afranzina admitted that Alexia had said many times he wished his father was dead. This didn't help things, but oddly enough, it was Alexia's other admission that probably sealed his doom. Afranzia reported that she often heard Alexia say, I shall bring back the old people and choose myself new ones according to my will. When I become sovereign, I shall live in Moscow and leave St. Petersburg simply as any other town. I won't watch any ships. I shall maintain troops only for defense and won't make any war on anyone. I shall be content with the old domains. In winter, I shall live in Moscow and in summer in Yaroslav. Probably not saying that right. This statement caused Peter to go ballistic. Alexei's refusal to support his father's modernization of Russia was anathema to him. Peter had spent his entire life turning Russia from a backward nation into an empire. The thought of his own son was willing to unravel all his work was way beyond anything Peter could tolerate. This was beyond betrayal of the highest magnitude. The inquisition of Alexia continued until a confession was extorted from him. Breaking down, Alexia was forced to implicate most of his friends against his will. Alexia then publicly renounced the succession to the throne in favor of the baby Grand Duke Peter Petrovich, Tsar Peter's first son by his second wife. We all know that information gained by extreme torture is unreliable. Despite Alfranzia's admission and other heresy evidence, there were no actual facts to go upon to prove Alexia guilty of a crime. Peter paid no heed. In the eyes of Peter, his son was a well-convicted traitor. He continued existence. His continued existence was a threat to Peter's life work. By Alexia's own words, his son's life was now forfeit. A horrible reign of terror ensued. In short time, the ex-Zarista Eudoxia, Alexia's mother, was dragged from her monastery and publicly tried for alleged adultery. Subsequently, all who had in any way befriended Alexia were racked to death on the wheel, then impaled and left to hang there in public. All this was done to terrorize the reactionaries into ceasing all talk of rebellion. Peter understood that as long as Alexia lived, all proclamations renouncing the throne were meaningless if Peter were assassinated. Alexei's claims to the throne would be immediately reinstated. Alexei had to go. Based on information Alexia was coerced to say during his confessions, Alexei was sentenced to death. So much for Peter's promise of amnesty. The thing to remember is that Peter was not mad in the sense of other tyrants like Nero or Caligula. He was an intelligent, educated man, completely capable of reasoning. But he was definitely mad in the other sense. Peter's temper was so extreme that he could not think straight. Peter's capacity for cruelty was well known, but his son's defiance had turned into a monster. He was so enraged that Peter came very close to executing his son with his own hands. Fortunately, Peter was spared this final ignominy when Alexia died from his wounds suffered while being tortured. The kid never had a chance. This story should be all that is necessary to explain why I hold Peter the Great in complete and utter contempt.
All right, so I'm going to place this website down in the description box below if you want to read further. Um, this guy, I agree with him 100%. When I found his website, I was like, same brother, same. And he wrote that back in 2012. So it's crazy. I mean, it reminds me a lot of Constantine. Actually, we're just talking about Constantinople. I mean, Const Constantine executed his own son, you know, so and, and boiled his wife alive. So yeah, anyway. So around this time, so after that happened in 1718, we're going to fast forward to 1724. And Anna Mons, the um, ex-mistress of Peter, before he married Catherine, or Marta, who became Catherine because Anna cheated on him. Well, her brother, Willem, was really good friends with Peter. And so Willem stayed on as like a secretary. And he became a secretary for Catherine, for Peter's wife. Well, Willem and Catherine started to have an affair. Peter found out about it, and he had his friend executed by beheading. Now, the interesting thing is he had his friend Willem's head, after being beheaded, put into a jar of alcohol where legend states he placed it in Catherine's room so that Catherine ha would have to look at his head every single day. Now, there are some legends that this head does still exist in some museum in Russia, although some people say, no, it's not there anymore. Listen, y'all, I will place in the description box below. We have talked about missing heads like Mata Hari. That's a totally different topic. I'm sure we will talk about it more in Aquarius Rising Africa, but I just wanted to let you guys know. Now, Willem was not charged with having... Uh, committing adultery with the the Tsarina. He in instead was charged with taking bribes because Peter was so embarrassed that his friend had an affair with his wife that he changed his death warrant to be taking bribes. I mean, what a freaking narcissist, right? Peter also ended up kind of making up with Catherine. And by 44 years old, Peter was definitely showing signs of very ill health. He had inflamed bowels. Basically, the dude had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. He had an inflamed liver. Um, just so many different, different health issues going on, which, of course, nowadays, these types of things can be handled and can be cured. And we know more about them energetically than they did back then. And so from, from the age of 44 to the age of 52, Peter's health started to majorly majorly decline we can call it karma to you guys let's just call it karma what goes around comes around and he ended up creating this new law where he was going to be able to pick who his successor was because of the fiasco with his son even though his first son by his second marriage with Catherine was technically in line to be um the next czar he actually made Catherine the empress so she was now given the role of empress and um this woman could not le read or write like she went from being a housemaid to now being the empress of russia so after peter died at 52 years old catherine the first was the empress of russia for two years now i'm not going to go too deeply into this woman because we're i'm just picking and choosing particular we are going to talk about another catherine next week catherine the great but this Catherine, Catherine the First, definitely the last few years of her reign, she lived the Paris Hilton lifestyle. She was partying. She didn't know how to read or write. Like, what was she going to do? Like, create policies? No. And anyway, so basically, Peter the Great's life ends with his second wife being a socialite. So, all right, you guys. <laughs> What do you think of Peter the Great? Were you under the impression that he was some like hero we should all be worshiping? Are you shocked to know what a horrific human being he was? What do you think? And please, once again, I'm going to put a link down to Aquarius Rising Africa down in the description box below. Please join us over at 9 o'clock Eastern Time if you can. Because I would love, with these conversations, uh, with us re-looking at history, I would really, really love to hear what you have to say about this person as we lead up to getting to the Anastasia conspiracy again, next time we're going to be talking about the scandalous Catherine the Great. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a terrific Monday and I will talk to you soon.